My name is Helma Hawkins. I'm Director of Children's Services for the Kansas City Public Library, and we are delighted to have all of you here this evening for what will be a very special program with our good friend, Roderick Townley. Um, I'm sure you all know Roderick's written many things, lived many places. He's uh, taught on a Fulbright in Chile. He's worked in New York City as an editor. He writes poetry, literary criticism, and won all kinds of awards. And we are delighted that he switched to writing children's and young adult literature because he's done some wonderful things there too. A few years ago when The Red Thread came out, Roderick was here to speak then. He's here now to speak about The Blue Shoe. And I think we've established a tradition here, don't you? So when, when the next one comes out, we'll be sure and do that too. But I'm looking forward with the rest of you to having an opportunity to hear Roderick speak about his new book tonight. Thank you. I'm so glad you guys came out and, uh, to see this production today. And I'm so glad to see the cover of my book on a 16-foot screen. <laughs> now, if only I could see it in lights. Um, on Broadway, that would be really great. This is my uh, sixth book for young readers like myself and uh, like my wife and uh, like my daughter. It's a striking cover. I was really uh, pleased to tell you the truth. I had no idea what the blue shoe was going to look like until Mary Grand Pre sent the first sketch for the cover. You know, it's odd you can write a whole book about something and not know what it looks like until somebody shows you. Um, we were very pleased to get uh, this illustrator uh, because, uh, as you probably know, she is the person who did all the Harry Potter covers and illustrators, illustrations, and she did a great job with this. We didn't think we could get her. Um, I don't know her at all, uh, but my publisher in, at Knopf knew her and wrote to her and said, I know you're busy, but we'd love it if you could take a look at the manuscript and maybe, maybe you'd like to do it. And uh, she's a busy lady, but um, she said, I love the book, I'm going to do it. And uh, so we were off to the races, really, with that. And um, it was a wonderful thing to have happen. Uh, it makes me, uh, with all these good things happening, in in fact, uh, the publisher uh, took out uh, all the stops and, and uh, went for gold foil on the cover and uh, published it, as you probably realize, in blue ink altogether, which is more, all more expensive for them in this time of recession. So I was really grateful to uh, the enthusiasm of my publisher. And uh, either they're crazy or they, they know something. Uh, anyway, uh, it makes me think about how it all began. Can you hear me? It's okay. Uh, up more. Or if I yeah. dip my head, but then I'll just look pretty stupid. Just hold it. Okay. Is this better? Yes. Ah. Good. Oh, both of these are on. I don't know if why. Okay. Well, all right. I'm sorry. But uh, thinking back to the way I first thought about this book, it, it had a very humble origin, as all my books do. And they all seem to start the same way. Uh, the lights are out. It's dark. There's a voice in the darkness. And it's my wife's voice. And she's saying, tell me a story. And uh, at that point, it's sort of meditations in an emergency. Uh, you've got about 12 seconds to come up with something. Uh, and I came up with, let's see, something like once upon a time. I always stall for time that way. Uh, a long time ago, think, think. Uh, and then I came up with there was a cobbler who made a shoe, a strange-looking shoe that didn't fit anybody. And yet, everyone who heard about this shoe was possessed with the desire to own it. 
And I went on for a bit. I have no idea what else I said, but I didn't have to go very far because, as you can hear, my mumbling voice tends to put people to sleep right away. And uh, it worked just fine. Uh, but I, I wasn't in the clear because the next morning, Wyatt said, you've got to write that story down. <laughs> I said, what story? There is no story. She says, write. OK, if you hear that tone of voice, you obey. Uh, especially since um, oh, about 10 years earlier, or eight years earlier, the same kind of scenario. I, I had another bedtime story uh, that she forced me to write uh, turned out into a novel called The Great Good Thing, which had quite a, quite a run for a bedtime story. Uh, it, um, you know, it was published, A, but it was published in several editions. It was published in China and in Japan and elsewhere, and it was optioned for movies uh, and large print and several other things. And even today, uh, it came out in 2001, somewhere in uh, Southampton in Long Island, a composer is writing an opera based on it. Uh, and that's very strange to me, <laughs> and I'm very grateful, but of course, my, my agent is very careful and didn't want to give any rights away that the movie guy wanted to keep. So we had to make the opera guy promise that it would only be, oh, very small, very non-Broadway, nothing big. Uh, so still, an opera. Wow, that's great. Uh, and uh, so I tend to take my wife's advice seriously. Um, and so I, I always resist, but uh, that doesn't work very much. So I, I see in my uh, journal that I wrote at the time uh, a notation. Wrote a couple of pages of a little story about a shoe. Doesn't seem very promising. But it's fun, and I hope to have a draft to give Wyatt on Mother's Day. Obviously, I was, must have been thinking I was going to just dash off a 10 or 12 page fairy tale and, and enclose it in a greeting card and, uh, and get some good points for that. Um, but three years later, and countless, countless drafts later, um, the postman comes by and thumps a package on my doorstep, and it is the author's copy, my first copy of this book here, uh, illustrated by the illustrious Mary Grand Pre, and uh, in blue ink and all those good things. Um, uh, as you can imagine, it was a bit of a process getting from a mumbled sentence in the dark about a shoe that doesn't fit to the daylight of publication. Um, and that first sentence, which wasn't much, <laughs> three years later, I might as well read what that sentence became. I don't know how to do it without actually plugging this onto myself again. Maybe I'll try it. Up here. Hello. OK. OK, here's that first sentence, which is evolved just a bit. Not long ago, I like this. What a, if I get the first sentence of a book, uh, it takes me months to get the first sentence. The first sentence of The Great Good Thing was, Sylvie had an amazing life, but she didn't get to live it very often. And once I got that sentence, I knew I was on my way. This one is quite different, but it's also kind of a fairy tale-ish kind of thing. Not long ago, in the sunny mountain village of Aplanap, famous for its tilted streets, cuckoo clocks, and finster cheese, there stood a small shoemaker's shop. And in the window of that shop, 
was a shoe that fit nobody. Of course, since it was only one shoe, it was doubly useless. Yet everyone who learned of this shoe was seized with the desire to own it. Curious travelers with hard money winking in their pockets came from as far away as Doubtful Bay. But the shoe was not for sale. You're thinking, this must have been a remarkable shoe. People lined up outside the shop just to look at the window. Even the town's mayor, whose name is far too long and important to write out here, felt tempted by it. He was an impressive man, but not an easy man to impress. Passing in his carriage, he'd have the coachman slow down so he could catch another glimpse of the famous object with its sapphires, opals, and moonstones flashing in the sun. Did I mention the shoe was covered with precious stones? Precious and semi-precious, and a few, like the beads of Murano glass, merely beautiful. And all of them blue. Blue of every description, from palest aquamarine, to clearest azure, to dramatic cobalt, to assertive navy, to deep-thinking indigo, a blue shoe. So that's what the first sentence became after just a bit of massaging for three years. Uh, of course, uh, once we've established that the shoe is blue, but there's a story yet to write. And uh, what we need is, what do we need? First thing I could think of was, who made this shoe? You know, we need characters, in other words. And uh, so, there has to be a shoemaker. And I, that was the first character I came up with. The shoemaker, I should say this right away, was a simple man. Nothing remarkable about him at all. Everyone called him Grell, which was his name, or as much of it as anyone could remember. Grell was neither very short nor very tall. He wasn't particularly thin nor exactly fat, neither ugly nor handsome. He had a beard, now threaded with gray, but most Aplanet men wore beards. He was poor, but not poor enough to be arrested. Um, so, okay, a character, a good Good man, obviously, but maybe not hero material, sort of nondescript. I still needed, I still needed if a hero or at least a main character, and I don't think Grell was going to be quite it. And so I gave him an apprentice, and there I found my main character. It was a good thing Grell had Hap, Hap Barlow, a young boy he'd taken in as an apprentice. A slim 13-year-old with nimble hands and likable eyes, Hap was smart in ways that Grell was not. Quick with numbers, sharp at business. More than once, he'd saved his absent-minded master from ruin. So I felt I had, had somebody here that I could work with. And actually, I came up with two main characters. Uh, Hap has a best friend whose name is Sophia. And uh, she's a very feisty and opinionated person who's also extraordinarily loyal. And uh, so the two of them go through these vast adventures, uh, which I knew nothing about when I started the book. Actually, I have to confess, I have maybe the worst approach to writing in terms of efficiency of anyone I know. Uh, most people not most, but smart people uh, work out in, in advance kind of what they're going to be writing. Uh, they, some people, I have several friends who go all the way to, in their minds, they know how it's going to end and they know even all the plot twists are most of them. I am sort of like a person entering a dark room and, and fumbling and touching one object and then the next object and say, oh, that's, that, oh, that's a character. I can use that. Um, but what is he going to do? Um, 
Hence, my books take years to write, and many more rewrites than ought to be the case. Uh, there may be an advantage to my approach, but I'm still trying to figure out what that might be. Um, in any case, I, 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 it, does, it does eventually work. Um, and I, of course, I need more characters. And here's the next one. The person who actually ordered the shoe to be made. Now, Grell Mel made and made the shoe, but he didn't do it on his own hook. Now, Mary Grand Pre is these are just pencil drawings, I believe. Um, but uh, somehow she's able to make those jewels glow, uh, even with the pencil. I'm, I'm just um, so impressed with, uh, and with the attention she paid to the words, because everything in there is act actually in the, in the book, in words. And she, she, didn't, she didn't get anything wrong. I've had books published where the heroine's hair color is blonde when she's really described as having brown hair. Uh, Mary did it great. She just did a wonderful job. Um, also, since I've told you my method, which is not knowing what I'm doing, the truth is this mysterious stranger, I didn't really know who it was until almost the end of the book, uh, which is just about a page and a half before the reader finds out who it is. Um, again, not the, not the most efficient way to write. Uh, but anyway, he orders this book to be done. He brings jewels. He overpays Grell. And there it is, the blue shoe. And in the background, you see uh, shadowy people looking in the window and, and uh, admiring this thing, as I do, now that I see what it looks like. Uh, but of course, we need more, more and more characters. We need villains. We need villains. And so I came up with the mayor, of course. Here he is, the mayor of Aplanap. Uh, anybody see the wart on his forehead? Yes, it's a very impressive wart on his forehead, and Mary Grandpre got it just right. And do you see on that wart, there are three little hairs. And these three hairs are very important because they wave about as the mayor is arguing a position or something. And anyone arguing against him is suddenly transfixed by these hairs. They try not to look at it because, you know, it's impolite. But you kind of can't help it. And they forget what they were about to, what their arguments were. And the mayor wins every argument because of that wart on his forehead. Um, it's just a really, I uh, think that, and, and you see behind him, uh, that's Grell. The, and you can see his expression, just a little bit alarmed because the mayor has a lot of power and is determined to get this shoe, this jewel-encrusted shoe for his, his wife, whom he admires greatly, who's called Ludmilla the Large. And she lives up to her name in many ways. She also has a very large, greedy uh, appetite for jewelry and shoes, which is, a, in this case, a bad combination. Um, and, but, well, here I am. And uh, we, we have the next one, which is, ah, isn't that beautiful? I just love that. That's one of the beggars that roam the streets of Aplanac. But I didn't mention that beggars are arrested in Aplanac, and they're sent off to um, the next mountain, which is called Mount Zexnax, with three X's in it. And that's a very fearsome and frightening place that no one who's sent there ever returns from. 
and uh, Hap's father was sent there and, um, a year before, and he has not returned. And uh, so naturally, Hap, being a wonderful, smart, quick, intelligent, and loyal boy, all good qualities, is determined to get over to Mount Zexnax and rescue his father. Uh, but now when I think about it, um, think about rescuing the father, it, it's a very resonant phrase for me, and I realize why. Um, I, didn't, I didn't realize this before I was starting to make this talk for tonight, such as it is, but uh, I realized that one reason it's resonant is that um, a long time ago, when I was 14 years old, uh, my father died, and I couldn't rescue him. Uh, I couldn't rescue my father. And uh, that same year, a couple of months later, my older brother died, and some months so apart from that, my grandfather died. So that year, I mean, I don't want to be at all heavy about it because it's actually a lighthearted book. Uh, but the truth is, I've been, when I think about it, frankly, I've been trying to rescue people ever since. Um, often, without, uh, often without success, but uh, this has been uh, sort of a, a you know, a, a subtone in my life and even realize that I've been, even tried to rescue other writers uh, as if they've been really uh, talented and are being forgotten. To me, that, that makes me almost panic <laughs> uh, to have a, a beautiful, uh, talented writer be forgotten, or an artist of any kind. Um, I remember one writer I did this, I made this attempt with, um, and I'm sure he is forgotten now. Has anyone heard of, for instance, um, Gil Orlovitz? Gil Orlovitz? Uh, no? Well, he's a remarkable poet and novelist, experimental novelist. Uh, and uh, when time I knew him, uh, he didn't have a typewriter, so I gave him mine. Uh, he didn't have any money, so I, I didn't either much, but I'd send him a check every, was it every couple of weeks, a small check just so they could get something. Turned out he pawned the typewriter and he uh, used the checks to buy bourbon. And um, a year or two later he collapsed in the street, sidewalk of New York City and was, and died and was buried in a a grave, uh, a special grave for uh, paupers without family, uh, which just enraged me. And I spent several years after that um, giving talks about him, writing articles about him, trying to convince his publishers to republish his, reissue his books. Um, that's the sort of impulse one has to try to rescue him. And obviously, metaphorically, to rescue myself. Uh, seeing myself certainly not as an alcoholic, but in some respects in his shoes. Uh, and of course, every writer hopes to, every artist hopes to rescue himself by doing something so s stupendously magnificent that he, he will never be forgotten. And so you have immortality that way. It doesn't really work, does it? But you, you try for that. Um, hmm. And so uh, I had Hap trying to rescue his father, and uh, not only his father, a whole race of Aukies. Now, do you know who Aukies are? Does anyone know <laughs> what an Aukie is? No? That's an Aukie. That's actually, you can tell, an elder in the Aki tribe because his nose, long as it is, is curved up instead of down. So he's one of the more important members. In fact, uh, he's of a race of trolls 
who lived inside of the mine shafts of Mount Zexnax, and they are enslaved by greedy people, and uh, and obviously treated very badly, like slaves are. And so, actually, the book is a little bit about slavery, revolution, prejudice, and all kinds of things. Uh, you know, Aukies are about three feet tall, give or take, and they uh, have these wonderful noses, and they're covered with fur. And um, this one, he's, he's really a wise one, and he can look into the flames and the shadows that are cast on the, on the wall of the cave. He reads them. His name is, well, put into English, it would be Shadow Reader. Uh, his name in Aki is Shadow Redr. Uh, in fact, the Aukis, of course, have their own language. And I had to learn that language uh, in order to write the book. And that was a lot of fun. <laughs> that was actually a lot of fun because uh, get to create a, create a whole culture. Uh, now, uh, I did have some help by knowing a little bit of ancient Anglo-Saxon and just a touch of Middle English, and then throwing in some stuff that made no sense whatsoever. And so when, when uh, one of the Aukies cries out, What? Ich komme am. Uh, anybody know what that might mean? It's some relation to English. It's, behold, I'm coming. I'm coming in, says the ferry boat man. He's bringing it in. Uh, and so it goes. I, I, uh, it was a trick to not only make up the language, but to make it understandable for any, any reader. <laughs> So I had a lot of fun, actually, when I wasn't in agony writing this book. Um, the plot it was, became more and more interesting to me. Uh, but uh, you know, a book is not just a plot. It's also, it also has to be about something. And uh, as I got into the Aki story, who live within the mountain and think of the mountain as a holy thing and believe in the goddess, Zexnax, uh, the, the under theme of the book came clear to me, and I realized it was also about the sacredness of the earth itself. So Hap was there to rescue his father, but when he was in this terrible mine shaft, working among these enslaved Aukis, it came to him that his real task was to rescue the mountain itself. And um, he, he came to feel that it was a lie. And he said, he thought this about it. I, it was strange, but being inside the mountain, he could feel its life, almost, almost its heartbeat. He felt it as an obscure shadow. I'm sorry. He felt it as an obscure sorrow, as if each blast of dynamite or stab with a pick opened another room, another wound. Hmm. Well, here they are, deep inside the mountain, Hap and Sophie. And she's been uh, starving, and he gives her something to buck her up. Now, if you're inside a mountain, what would you give somebody to eat? Any ideas from <laughs> herbs? Earthworms. Earthworms. That's a good guess. No. Close, but no. Anything? Anybody else have an idea? Ooh. You can tell sort of by the look on her face that she's not too excited about this. And yet, it it is it is very nourishing. It's a steaming hot bowl of rat tail soup. There are plenty of rats in the mine, so uh, there's no, no lack of things to eat. Now, this is one of my 
favorite illustrations in the book. It's got a lot to it. it. It seems almost like there's an Escher influence in the, the flocks of birds that are swirling around there. Uh, uh, and I don't know about the, the waves of Doubtful Bay below there, uh, a little bit of Van Gogh's Starry Night, I don't know. Uh, but uh, I, there's all kinds of things I cannot tell you about this illustration because it would give away too much. So. I will say that there's a secret in it. I'm glad she saw that uh, Mary Grand Pre and, and put it in it so that those who get to that point or who are very, very smart will be able to figure out the secret of that picture. But for most of us, we just have to wait till you get to that part to see. But. Um, it just makes me, again, grateful that we got her as, as an illustrator because I think she did a wonderful job. So, I don't know. Again, when, as I blunder into a book, as I said, I, I really don't know where I'll come out. Just hope I do come out and uh, I just step out on faith and, and pray a little bit, I guess. And also, these days, Lately, I've been asking my brain trust for some help. I, um, I uh, came up with a, a number of readers, certain readers, most of them kids, not all, some teachers, who uh, have agreed to be informal consultants to me uh, when I run into a, a snag, which happens. And uh, I email them and uh, with a question, say, what, what would you do here if you were writing this? And I get some very strange and interesting answers, and I don't, I seldom use them actually as given. Some of them are quite weird, but um, it always jogs me a little bit and gets me out of my own rut, maybe into another rut, I don't know, but it makes it possible for me to move forward a little bit. So, uh, if any of you would like to join my brain trust and have me email you when I get totally snagged with, with questions and I don't know where to turn, uh, see me afterwards. I'll, I'll take your email and put you on the list and uh, I will turn to you in my hours of distress in the future. Um, and that's, that's about it, except I suppose um, I, I just have no uh, advice to give writers. People always say, well, A, how do I get published, or well, how should I write, or any tips. I've, what I've really said is, I don't know how to do this. And that's not very helpful. Um, but maybe the only thing I can say that might be of some help is, that on some sleepless night in the dark, uh, when you hear a voice asking you, tell me a story, I would say don't stop and question whether you're up to it or not. Just take a deep breath and uh, begin once upon a time and let it go from there. Hey, thank you very much.